Well, hello and welcome from the Healing Live Vintage Show down in Sussex in the south of England. Bit of a last minute thing, didn't think I was gonna get here and be able to film today, but here we are. Really, really pleased to be here. As you can probably hear, we've got all the stationary engines chugging away behind this. I mean, they will run all day. But uh, we're gonna start with cars, we'll probably come back to the engines. Uh, I'm gonna see what I can find. But it's interesting. We're not going to look at every car. This isn't going to be one of my usual walk arounds. But if I see something that is really of interest to me, then I will share it with you. Like this Mark 1 Cortina, uh, which still has the fake wood down the side of it. Uh, in fact, that looks a little more realistic than some. So that's really nice. The Ford Cortina Mark 1 Estate is an extremely rare car. Uh, so it's lovely to see one of those here. We'll just enjoy the size difference here. It's a 1966 Ford Thunderbird, which I know because it says so on the number plate. Uh, I'm not very good on American cars. Next to uh, a Singer uh, Roadster, which I think had a little overhead cam engine. Now let's see if we can squeeze in for a look. There we go, Singer motor cars. Lovely. But uh, we'll just go around the back because I have a feeling these Thunderbirds had, we're not going to see them in action, but I think they had sequential indicators on the back of them. So each sector, uh, it sort of lit up uh, in line. But also a Dodge Polara here. That looks absolutely magnificent. And already I'm just walking around the camera, aren't I? Like I said, I wouldn't. But we're just taking the beautiful American styling of the British Vauxhall Cresta. Uh, Vauxhall obviously part of uh, uh, General Motors. And uh, it, it's interesting this because this style dated really quickly and they got quite a lot of grief for it. Even having the wraparound front windscreen. I mean, full on Detroit styling mode. But these days they are so collectible. And I think they're a beautiful car and a really lovely car to drive as well. Six cylinders, uh, usually three on the tree, uh, column gear change, lovely, lovely cars. I'm just gonna keep going along this lineup uh, getting busy, everyone's pouring into the show. Uh, this Austin taxi, uh, I think he just leaves it running. So come and have a listen to this. Oh yeah. An Austin FX3 D taxi. Uh, it was uh, launched in 1948 and they ran till 1958. Got a 2.1 litre, 55 brake horsepower, diesel look at the cool dudes in the back there's the drivers cab all very cramped so this is the forerunner of the fx4 effectively oh look he's even got the lights on and he's just leaving it running and i'm sure it will run all day uh, that'll be absolutely marvelous look at the brown going on here i've seen a 30 on the left and a hillman minx on the right oh gosh and we've got an allard here sydney allard being the only person to win the Monte Carlo rally with a car bearing his own name. This is a P1 saloon. Usually used American side valve, 3.6 litre V8 engines, but you could get Cadillac overhead valve engines to make them truly terrifying. And more American content here. Massive Lincoln Continental. The headlamps just peeking out there. That is a big, big car. Uh, shout out to the MGA. There's another one in a gorgeous non-red color. Very, very nice. But there's something else interesting I want to see along here. And here it is. I believe this is a Jensen Interceptor, the original Interceptor. A very rare car that looks somewhat questionable. What a fantastic color though. And they didn't sell many of them. Um, used, uh, I think, the um, Austin four liter six cylinder engine, if I remember rightly. Uh, Jensen was a company based in West Bromwich near Birmingham. Obviously plenty of um, your um, everyday uh, British classics. Ford uh, Zephyr convertible here, I think that was car bodies. Uh, next to an E-type Vauxhall. Again, quite American in style. Uh, we've got an MG here on the 1100, 1300 Sunbeam Rapier. Yeah, yeah nice lineup. Oh, hello. That's an Austin Westminster. This one looks quite mischievous. I used to have a Westminster myself features the c type uh c series sorry uh six cylinder engine and just like mine twin su's uh, they had a, a single zenith carburetor originally and they were a little 
sluggish, but believe me, with Twin SUs, they go very nicely indeed. Uh, split screen, Morris Minor pickup. Uh, it's got the, uh, that would have had the little 803cc engine from new. And look at this, oh my gosh. This is what I love about these shows. It's a Lancia van. And you might think, well, that must be rare. Was it sold in the UK originally? I suspect not, judging by the number plate. But it has been imported. But Lancia was very late to switch over to left-hand drive, even for the home market in Italy. Right-hand drive was seen as more exotic and more luxurious. So even into the 1950s, you couldn't buy a left-hand drive Lancia. Uh, that's a, a beautiful thing. I've never seen one of those. So there you go. That is something I've never seen before. Uh, let's go a bit wider on the angle if I can. There we go. It might make walking around the show a bit easier. That is absolutely beautiful. A uh, very sensible addition of some more modern lights. The original lighting being somewhat austere. <laughs> that was a Lancia Ardea. You just see uh, in there. Wow. That is absolutely beautiful. And that's what I love about shows like this. Yes, you get a sea of British classics that you see absolutely everywhere. Then you get something like that. We'll just take a moment to take in the showman's vehicle there. Uh, showman's motorhome. Very much um, Miss Hubnut's cup of tea. And uh, we'll see what we've got along here. A Ford Galaxy uh, larging it up next to another Sunbeam Rapier. So we do have quite a few American cars over here. Uh, a patinated bug, a Ridey RM. Roadster, that's interesting. That doesn't look like the factory roadster. The RM, um, what was it? RMC was the factory roadster. That doesn't look like one. I think that may have been modified. So, oh no, shocking, eh? Uh, we've got lots of Fords down here, which is hardly surprising. South of England is where Fords were made. But here's another beauty: a Peugeot 404 Familial Estate with that classic Farina styling right-hand drive and three rows of seats a beautiful beautiful car uh, quite an early morris minor here very simple rear lighting uh, it, is a, it is a low light one so that is um, a very early morris minor uh, everyone likes to point out but the reason for the split here is because the car was widened at the last minute but it also allows access for the starting handle uh, it was the Morris Mosquito until they decided to call it Minor. They'd already used the Minor name before. But yeah, Sir Alec Isagonis wanted a flat four engine for his Minor. He never got it. He used a side valve four instead. Enormous Cadillac. That's uh, huge. Uh, we should assume that lady is not dead. Uh, modified Ford Anglia convertible. Oh yeah, we've got some seriously modified stuff here. It's a console. And here we go, look, we've got the uh, PA uh, Crestor or Velox here next to um, a big old Chevrolet. And you can really see how um, America influenced these British cars. That's lovely. Oh, it is a Crestor. Very, very nice. Look, massive tail fins. Uh, the earlier ones had a split window in three pieces uh, next to a Chevrolet Bel Air in the same colours. I wonder if they're a part of the same wedding fleet. It's got that feel going on, hasn't it? Oh, here we go, VLT8. One of the uh, route masters just coming in. That's lovely. RM8, that one apparently. Although it's worth pointing out, bodies and running gear and everything was shuttled around. Uh, so one bus began life as one type and could evolve into something else. That, that's lovely. I'm loving the period adverts on it. We're going to look at buses in a moment, but hey, look at this. A pair of Lotus Elites. Extraordinary. So the Lotus Elite was the first car to have a glass fiber monocoque. So no chassis, just glass fiber with bits of metal um, in the uh, body in places where s s extra strength was needed. Very, very light, superb handling. They're great to see here. Yeah, up at the back. We got um, a DKW, uh, part of the o Auto Union, which is why it's got what today is seen as an Audi badge. But uh, yeah, DKW, it's got the um, free equal six, uh, three cylinder, two stroke engine. E each engine has its own ignition coil. The uh, radiator here at the back 
They sound absolutely magnificent, beautiful car. I've always loved these. I've read a restoration magazine when I was quite young and uh, fell in love with the looks, the pillarless styling. Absolutely beautiful car. So David has owned this uh, DKW since 1972 and he says the starter motor is not very happy but we're going to see if she'll go. So uh, fingers crossed. There we go. That sounds absolutely beautiful. Mostly what you hear is the fan noise but if we come around the side here. Oh yeah. It's a very smooth two-stroke engine. So yeah, what an absolute beauty. And thank you car for starting. <laughs> well, uh, an amazing selection of uh, classic cars, but classic buses also here because this is indeed a festival of transport. And I'm loving this guy, a London transport guy, um, wins for bonnet mascot. Look at that, beautiful. Imagine that thundering around the streets of London, that's next to a Bedford with Empress on the side of it, a dinky little Bedford coach. Uh, we've got an AEC here. And uh, that's sort of got a hint of Routemaster about it, but a lot of buses were converted into recovery vehicles. So once their days as a bus were over, uh, you could convert it so it would have a big hook on the back so you could tow uh, other buses with it. I don't know if that's what's happened with this one, I imagine so. That's lovely. But uh, right at the end of half cab bus designs, this sort of feature would take over where the cab was kind of extended both sides so the half cab was lost. But yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, another AEC next to it. See, I'm getting caught out now because I'm not an expert on buses. Uh, Leyland Titan, I think. Uh, have we got some information about this one? PD212, Leyland's own Farrington hybrid body. So that dates from 1951. Absolutely lovely. Uh, Bristol VRT, I think, next to it. The T um, referring to the transverse engine. Uh, the VR began life with a longitudinal engine up the back. Uh, another big AEC. Uh, so not a Routemaster, but it has got a diesel engine. So Routemaster were developed specifically for London and didn't really find many buyers outside London. So I suspect, yeah, it's a Regent. So much more traditional. I suspect that Wrecker was also a Regent. Uh, another London Transport single decker. Again, quite unusual. Underfloor engines. And, uh, oh, this is a beautiful, this is a Harrington body. Uh, I had models of these, a couple of these. Exclusive first editions, anyone remember those? And uh, yeah, I've got a couple of those. Grenadiers and Cavaliers, I think their coach bodies were. Lovely, another big Bedford on a day tour. Uh, AEC RT, this is the forerunner of the Route Master. And London Transport had even more of those in service, I think. That's RT 1798. Wow. And then we got a good selection of Route Masters here. And uh, obviously Route Master Geeks will be able to take you through all the differences. Uh, like why this one has quad headlamps. But uh, look at this. We're just in time. One of the traction engines moving around. They have got steam here. I don't know if that's off to do ploughing. So this big drum is used for ploughing. Drag a plough across the field. You'd have two of these. Now they've got the tricky job of steering it. Look at the steering lock on that. So the steering works by turning that bar with the chain on it there. So it's going to be a three or four point turn, I think, going on here. So as he turns the wheel, 
you will see that chain get turned and that literally just pulls on the front axle. Absolutely magnificent. We shall get well out of their way uh, to make life easier for them. Oh, that's loud. Marvellous. Uh, Bedford Green Goddess fire engine. These were on standby for most of their life in the UK and very rarely saw action. Uh, there was a fireman's strike in the early 2000s and these were used by soldiers to uh, provide a service. But yeah, steam lorry there, a sentinel. It's wonderful. The smell here, absolutely beautiful. The condition and the character look the little giant. Brilliant. Uh, there's old Scammel, I think. It's called Betty. Wow. So yeah, there's all sorts. And if we move around, uh, the fairground has some uh, classic trucks as well, like this old Foden here with a big old generator on the back, providing power for the Dodgems here. That is lovely. Triple wipers, the middle one seems in mild disarray, but such is the life of a showman's vehicle. So on a D plate, that's from about 86, 87, I think, but yeah. Look at this, got lots of lovely old period um, fairground stuff. Got the, uh, the merry-go-round going round. Yeah, I do like to go on the dodgems. Always good fun. Well, they're three wheelers, aren't they? So they're my idea of fun. Right, should we go and check out the stationary engines? Here we go then, down the line of stationary engines. So the water's steaming because that is the coolant. Uh, smoky little two-stroke down there. They've got engines of all sizes. A Lister Junior with a wellhead pump. It's got a lovely action on it. Look at that. Lovely. A Bamford. I wonder if that's the same Bamford that um, was related to JCB. That's a hit and miss. So the engine slows down, it then triggers some action. Look at this monster. Oh. The Blackstone. Again, hit and miss, you can just hear it fire occasionally, very quietly. And I was chatting to the owner of this engine. Oh yeah, this is a CJ Megave Felix from 1911. And it was actually discovered um, providing water for an orchard fairly near where I live. Today it's running a generator with this bank of lights. Got the exposed valve gear on it. It's been beautifully restored. And uh, yeah, a Ruston, Ruston Hornsby. Love these very, very British names. So uh, yeah, I don't think we've been to a show with this many stationary engines before. So this, this one here has been used to drive a lathe. So, yeah, transformative. Oh, listen to that one. Heta Acorn Top. Love it. Absolutely love it. And it's nice to see the engines doing something a bit more than just running. So actually driving lathes. And uh, I don't even know what that is. An Australian engine. One of three in the country. So he's got his belt off at the moment while he's fettling. Uh, in GECO. Hit and miss. Driving a little uh, grinder over there. Or mincer, I suppose. I'll just have a spin around here. Petter light, that's chugging away quite merrily, isn't it? Look at that. Love it. You can see so much going on. A milling machine there, Henry Bamford and Sons. Driven by a Petter. We've got a Manco here driving a little water pump. So the big heavy flywheels help it keep going even though it's only firing every now and then. It's the uh, hit and miss design. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Dinky little Hercules gasoline engine from Indiana, USA. Wow. And I think the people 
who keep these engines going and restore them do an amazing job because quite often you can't get parts for these engines anymore so you literally have to uh, make it again oh here we go he's got his drive belt going again so he's driving his grinding wheels lovely oh i wish you could smell this smells absolutely delicious there will be a steam parade later on so hopefully we can uh, see a few of these marvellous machines in action. The bus one is due fairly soon. We've got military vehicles going on at the moment. Uh, so there's a Mercedes-Benz G-Wagen built by Magna Steyr uh, in Austria. So effectively related to uh, my Invercar. Uh, it's a Daimler Ferret going around with a pre-selector gearbox. Really unusual steering wheel position in those, I think I've mentioned before. But uh, yeah, we, we have got uh, an announcer here doing a lot of shouting over the top, so I do apologize for that. Uh, Jeep coming round behind. So many World War II Jeeps. Uh, Land Rover forward control, 101 inch. Is it still V8? Yeah, sounds like it's still V8. Vroom, vroom. Right hand drive, actually quite rare. Most of those were left hand drive. So, uh, yeah, I, I fear the announcement isn't going to help us there. So we'll carry on going past. Got more steam wagons going on. Uh, steam rollers here. And of course, miniature ones as well. So if your garage won't take one of these behemoths, you can always get something a little bit smaller and uh, so he's got a flywheel driving this belt to a huge generator on the front so you can light it all up it's absolutely beautiful perfect miniatures more miniatures up here see that one fits in your tent a little Foden lorry replica this one on a 17 plate so you know it's only six years old little tender little water absolutely magnificent look it's even got headlamps brilliant uh, big old AEC Matador I think these huge uh, military trucks quite a lot of people in the cab of that one wow absolutely brilliant Oh yeah, this one's ticking over in neutral, so you can see all the beautiful movement going on. Oh, hello, you sound nice. I like the sound of that. Lovely, so intricate movement everywhere you look. Part of the lubrication system. Oh, listen to that. Massive scammel sounded magnificent. Now, there's another one for Miss Hubnut though. Look, we got uh, another old caravan, an airflow. Uh, presumably. That's a strange name because the front of it is absolutely flat. That is the front, but then it tear drops off of it. Uh, that's an amazing thing. Let's go and see what else we got. This is like a, a more vintage section, I think. Uh, what have we got there? Mercedes. Oh my gosh. So this dates from before 1926 when Mercedes and Benz merged. Just come back to have a better look at this Mercedes. It's a 1904. Uh, it was first owned in this country by a Viking Cowdery. It has a nine litre four cylinder engine. And you can see all this part of the lubrication system here, so you can see what's going on. Uh, the brakes on the right, but that operates on the transmission. It's got big drum brakes at the back. And uh, the owner's father restored, bought and restored the car in the early 1970s. And uh, it's been in the family ever since. And the condition is just extraordinary you can really see the age because it's still um yeah just so simple in terms of bodywork but absolutely beautiful so from being abandoned in the woods for several decades it's looking an awful lot better 
today. Uh, hand signals only, although someone has actually fitted indicators to the, this little um, Austin Big 7, I think it is. I'm probably, yeah, I think so. Could be wrong, it could be a 10, but I think it's a Big 7. I've got an Alvis low and rakish next to it a chevrolet race car wow uh, an ss jaguar so jaguar starting to use that name but it was ss cars ford model t a bsa uh, bsas were um, very intriguing cars obviously more famous for making motorbikes um, but uh, this isn't one but they did make some front wheel drive cars as well so that's fascinating morris 8 series e oh gosh more classics we're gonna have a lot more to see don't worry we'll get to those uh, we'll just have a look down this lineup um, austin 7 ruby austin 7 special uh, big austin 12.4 i think and look at this that is absolutely tremendous i don't know when it was painted orange but i think it was probably quite a long time ago Oh, memories of the Austin 7 we took for a drive. Very, very similar. Uh, another Ruby next to it. Such pretty little cars. Oh, absolutely gorgeous. An Austin 6, much bigger. And then another Ruby. Lots of Rubies about. Let's go and see what uh, we've got over here. A Bruff Superior. What? Wow, there we go, Bruff Superior, but it's got a Hudson engine, so that'll be an American engine. They're the same company that made the bikes. I did have a go at cars, it didn't quite work out for them. I think this is a Hudson here as well. No, it's a Buick. Shows you what I know about American cars. That is enormous. Look, look how the headlamps are attached. It's like jet technology going on. I'm well out of my comfort zone here, but loving it, loving the variety. Uh, what have we got here? A Sunbeam. A reminder that Sunbeam was a fine motor company. Uh, this was registered in 1930, apparently. 2.2 litre, six cylinder overhead valve. Another Sunbeam next to it, wow. And then look at this Renault. Oh my gosh. So Renault was one of the last companies to use a rear mounted radiator the radiator behind the engine very unusual but uh, they certainly had enough success with it a uh, big ford model a i think the replacement for the t uh, morris eights variously wow oh there's an interesting car bond keep gt4s i used to own one of these i saved it from the scrappage scheme uh, based on triumph herald uh, chassis, in fact the headlamps I think very similar to the Vitesse, the doors were from a Vitesse as well I think, but a plastic body bonded to the chassis and it's an intriguing thing, Bond more famous for making cars like the mini car, the three wheeler, uh, nice Mark 6 Escort next to it as well, quite an early Reliance Scimitar SE5, still on Steelys, oh I applaud that that is very nice. That's about 1968, which I think was the first year of production for these um, GT estates, effectively. Um, but yeah, look, we've got Mondeos, we've got a Mitsubishi Galant in the lineup. That's a rarity. And a Reba Puck caravan there next to a Morris Marina. Yeah, that's lovely to see. That's a bit of a surprise. I didn't expect more modern stuff to be here, but nonetheless, it is. Oh, I see a Honda N600. So, oh, and of course we've got tractors as well. Oh my gosh, there's still so much to see. Yeah, look at that Honda N600. Beautiful. Elderly first owner, do we think, OAP? These are fascinating cars. I do have a road test of one of these on my channel, so do check it out. Uh, so yeah, we've got all the cars you kind of expect, really. A Vauxhall Corsa, great to see. But look at this, Mitsubishi Sapporo. Wow, that's a rarity. There are some delicious nuggets to be found in this show, so we shall keep on hunting. Oh, Miss Hubner is going to be gutted she's not here. Shout out to the Astra van, modified in a 16 valve GSI style, very of its time. Classic camper club. So we've got a Toyota Hi Ace, 
Mark III Transit, a fairly early one. On oh, Seaplay, that's very early. That is changeover year, I think, from the Mark II Transit to the Mark III. It's radically different with this sloping front. Uh, Renault traffic predates uh, these um, slopey front uh, transits, to be fair. That'll bring back some memories for Miss Hubnut. And we've got a transit camper here. It's got the long snout on it, which suggests it's probably got a diesel engine or the inline uh, petrols. Uh, they had to extend the snout uh, on those. Uh, oh, gosh, stock car racing, MG Magnet. That makes me sad and happy at the same time because it is still here, it still survives. But uh, yeah, uh, comma. I think there were highwaymen bodies on these. Love the louvered windows. Uh, and more recent Toyota, that would be a, an import. Um, I don't know what that would be badged as over here. We, we would have got this as a high ace, but it might be different as it's a Japanese import. Uh, there are no clues. We will never find out. I apologize. Oh, cheeky little Nissan Micra hiding up the back over there. Lovely. Bedford CF, uh, the facelift version. That's great. A uh, little splitty and another comma with a highwayman body. And another Ariba Puck. These light little um, campers are uh, yeah, very popular with people because they're easily towed by smaller cars. They can even be towed by a 2CV, believe it or not. And uh, got an H-Van here as well. But the uh, Citroen folk out in force, it seems. Good to see, they're having a nice time over there. Renault 10, rear engine saloon. Very unusual. Oh gosh, and here's a car I know very well. So I mentioned that this car was a bit special and now we're going to explore exactly why. I'm here with uh, Paul, who is the son of the original owner. So what is special about this car? Well, this car came from, it was bought in Tokyo in 1969, I think, mm -hmm. and, or 1970, and when my dad was working in Japan uh, for, at that time, BOAC, which then became British Airways. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when he moved back to the UK, he brought the car back with him. So he imported it back into the UK, changed the speedometer for from kilometers to miles per hour. Yeah, yeah. Um, luckily, because Japan is right-hand drive, no need to do anything about the steering. Indeed not, no. And, um, and he's had it ever since. He's kept the car. It's pretty much original condition. He's hardly changed anything on it at all. Blimey. So w when did it come back to the UK? 1972, I think he, he brought it. Oh, yeah, that would explain the number plate, because the number That's, plate would have been okay. the uh, you import the car, not necessarily the, uh, the car is. That's right. Yeah, That's wow. Right. Yeah. So you must have many childhood memories of this car then. I do. Um, well, <laughs> funny enough, it was the car they used to uh, take me to boarding school in and, uh -huh. uh, when they were uh, travelling overseas. Um, and uh, yes, for many years afterwards, it was the daily runner for the family. Um, funny enough, though, I never got to drive it. Oh, but I understand your sister did. Y yeah, apparently she's a better driver than I am, which is... Um, <laughs> You know, I feel a little bit annoyed about, but um, there you are. Um, Super. And your parents still alive and well today? Yes. Uh, my dad's, uh, what is he, coming out 87 years old. Wow. Um, my mum's uh, 83. Um, so they're still here um, at the show today. They try and come every year if the weather's good. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, and then it's... Basically, it's the only time the car gets to leave the garage. The rest Aww. of the time, it's kept... Yeah, but so many family right. memories. That's one heck of an heirloom, isn't it? It's just so important to all of you. It's great to see it again, because I featured this car in Retro Japanese many years ago, had a drive. It's a 1970 Datsun Bluebird of the 510 variety. A surprisingly advanced car, overhead cam engine, independent rear suspension. Dual carb. Dual carbs, yeah. So it's a lovely bit of kit and a very rare example and a fascinating history. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, we better have a look at the military vehicles. We've got a couple of Jeeps here. But something I've not seen before is the amphibious version of the Jeep. Uh, not very many. I think about 12,000 of these were actually made, but they decided to focus on the DUKW, the Duck you know, six-wheel truck amphibious. These were seen as a little unstable, I think. They've got the exhaust popping out up here. But, you know, this one's been swimming. 
And look, you can see them going all over the place. It's absolutely brilliant, fascinating bit of history. But the, uh, yeah, the duck, I have driven, so you can see one of those. Uh, I don't know, is that a Humber? A Humber did make military vehicles for a time. It's going to be a bit of a voyage of discovery for me because military vehicles aren't my thing. I have no idea what this remarkable track device is. So only some of these came into the, uh, uh, the uh, ring earlier. I guess that one is going to churn the ground up a bit if you get too carried away. A grasshopper, apparently. Uh, that's an Austin badge on that one. Uh, old, good old Land Rover Series 3 and uh, the, uh, the Forward Control 101. Uh, AEC Matadors, plenty of those about. Here is that uh, Scammel we saw in the ring. Absolutely enormous. And they have incredible flexibility. The front axles can really pivot to help them get over stuff. Uh, it's extraordinary. But yeah, what, what a show this is. There is so much to see. And even the recovery trucks are quite interesting. Could go and have a look at those maybe. Uh, another Austin uh, Series 1 Land Rover. Look at that. Early Series 1 with the headlights behind the grill. So we're going to take a closer look at this uh, Land Rover. It is from 1949 and uh, only recently these um, original decals have been repainted onto it in fact there was a sticker on the windscreen here but it's been lovingly recreated and hand painted it's absolutely beautiful so it's one of the first batch of military land rovers built in 1949 this one dating from november it's still got the trafficators uh, the indicators of their time that ping out and tell you which way uh, the driver's going but yeah, some lovely details. It's kitted out with um, fairly period radio. I think the radio dates from 1955 in this one. But again, uh, recalling the time it would have served at Dover Castle. So this is actually a replacement tailgate. The original tailgate with the original decals does exist. But yeah, what a beautiful example of a Series 1. The start of military Land Rovers. Oh, this is quite interesting. This is Terrain, uh, Jaguar and Land Rover Specialist. This is a Discovery 4 Naked, which uh, I'm told isn't too horrific a job to achieve because many of the jobs, much of the servicing on the engine is best done uh, with the engine, well, with the body removed. Gosh, so this one was from 2012. It covered 180,000 miles when it holed the block. And that was the end of that. That's a lot of complexity going on. Old guys rule. Why, yes, they do. Now, this is lovely to see a lineup of Vauxhalls. We've got the Corsa next to it, the earlier Nova, Mark III Cavalier, Mark II Belmont, the uh, booted Astra uh, to us, a cadet you know, in Europe. Whereas the Mark III Astra became an Opel Astra as well. Turbo diesel, the old Suzu engine, I think, in that uh, Mark III Cavalier, Mark II Cavalier next to it. Wonderful. And over here, Fiat 500s, including this delightful little Giardiniera, or Giardiniera, I suppose it is. They don't have a soft G in Italy, do they? Uh, estate. Aren't they absolutely gorgeous? They've got the same canted and over engine as the Auto Bianchi Bianchina uh, I drove fairly recently. And of course, you've got to have a sunshine roof. Gives a lovely view of the interior. Gorgeous. This is an earlier Fiat 500. Nice with the suicide front doors. And then uh, a much later one from about 1970. Yeah. Oh, the tractors must be going next. They're starting to fire up the tractors. Got thrashing demonstration, or thrashing, sorry, over there. And uh, yeah, the tractors are starting to fire up for there. You go. So, what an amazing show! And uh, yeah, it's been absolutely splendid. I'm sorry I haven't chatted to more people, it's just been a bit full on. I'm kind of mildly overwhelmed by it all. But thank you ever so much for watching, and we'll see you in a future video. Farewell. I had to finish on a headlamp wiper. It's the only way to travel.